Hello everyone. The moral of today's story is how many times can I mess up this recording? This will be my third attempt at recording this today. I was about five minutes into the last one and there was a sound from outside that sounded like the end of the world. I don't know what it is. It sounded like a military jet on afterburner straight up above my house. I have no idea what's going on out there. Probably not good. I'm also surrounded by what I'm going to be working on later. People send me books, publications from all over the world, and I like to try to photograph them and write a little bit about why I like what they are and why they did. It's just about people sharing. It doesn't matter how they were made, how many, what it cost, how many they've sold. None of that matters. It's just about saying, hey, this is an interesting publication. So I have about 10 of these that I'm on the hook for sometime between now and the end of the day. It's kind of a pain logistically, but hey, who cares? What else am I going to do? It's 28 and blowing snow here. I'm not going anywhere. The original intent of this film was to do a very standard notes on photography breakdown about an image that someone wrote in and asked me about. As a standalone image, I'm not in love with it. But as part of a project, it actually works really well. And I get, thought to myself, you know what, I'm leaving something on the table here because I get a lot of questions from people about what to photograph. And that is such a bewildering question to me because, and I'm not blowing my own horn here, I've just never had a problem coming up with story ideas. I mentioned to you how important reading is in my life, and if you read, I don't think you're ever gonna be hurting for finding good stories. To this morning I came up with two more ideas just based on skimming books that I haven't even started to read yet. So coming up with what to shoot. So the, the image I wanna show you is part of a long-term project, but how I got there is a very roundabout story that I think deserves a little time here because it's very representative of how things work in photography or at least how they used to work. So let's go back. I'll break this image down eventually, but let's go back to the late 90s. I'm in Los Angeles. I meet a photographer who is actually a writer and has yet to become a photographer, but she's very interested in becoming a photographer and she's a very good writer. So a, a Magnum photographer who's a mutual friend introduces us in LA. I meet with her and she shows me some work. And I look at this one project she has and I'm like, where is this? What is this? And she goes, oh, that's Sicilian Easter. These are processions that go through the streets in Sicily. It's incredible. That's what I have, that's what I'm showing you. So I look at these images and I'm, I'm kind of blown away by these things. And she says, hey, we should go back next year and we should go together. So this gets the ball rolling on my long-term project about Sicilian Easter, which I went, I think I spent four years, I, I made four trips to Sicily, which at the time from Los Angeles was kind of a comedy in itself. The flights into in and out of Palermo were always changing. So I would have to go like LA, New York, New York, Frankfurt, Frankfurt, Milan, Milan, Rome, Rome, Palermo. It was hellish. There was one time I fell asleep in the airport in Zurich and I had wrapped all the straps of my bags around my arms and legs because I was so exhausted. And someone I knew actually managed to come up and take all of my bags without me waking up. That tells you how exhausting it was getting back and forth. That was half the fun, half the battle was like, this is, you gotta earn it, you gotta wanna do this. So I go over and I'm working on this project and it is immediately to me one of the best things I've ever done. There's so little sense of commercialism. There's no other photographers. There was one famous photographer working there at the same time and he was a total jerk. Anyway, that's another story. That's a side story, a tangential story to what I'm about to tell you. So I work on this project and the fourth year of the project, I'm by myself. So I've gone over uh, the last two years, I think I went by myself. My wife was there, but there were no other photographers except for my, the friends that I'd met in Palermo who were other photographers and we would sometimes go out together. So uh, for some reason on this trip, Leica loans me a camera. Why they loan me a camera, I have no idea because I shoot M6s and M4s and at the time I had two working Leicas and two lenses and that's really all I needed, but somehow I end up with this mystery third Leica. They send me this thing. And it's not just a Leica, it's not an M6, it's not an M7. It is a limited edition M7 that's covered in some sort of material like snakeskin or something. And it's clearly not meant to be used. It's meant to be collected and put in a box and never utilized. So I get it and I'm absolutely mortified because I look up the cost and I'm thinking, oh my God, this is more than I'm actually worth. And so I can't use this in the field. If, some, if I get robbed or something happens or I fall down or I lose it, where I get hammered and I leave it in some bar somewhere, this is not gonna be good. So I leave the camera in my friend's apartment in Palermo and then I go for two and a half weeks, I go into the field and I shoot day and night on this my main project which is about religious processions. But I come back to Palermo and I have two and a half days left on my trip 
and I see that camera on the floor and I go, I gotta use it because Leica's never gonna loan me anything ever again if I don't use this camera. So I say to myself, okay, my main project is over for the year. What can I do in two and a half days in Palermo that I don't need access, I don't need permission, I don't need model releases, location releases, any of that stuff. What can I do, what freedom can I do with this camera in the street? So I get the camera, I leave everything else in my friend's apartment, and I start walking the streets of Palermo. And literally a block out of his apartment, I look down and there is a pack of street dogs. And Palermo has a lot of street dogs. And when street dogs hook up, it's always breeds that should never hook up. And so you end up with this assortment of animals that look like something from the circus. They're hilarious. So I look down, I see this pack of dogs, and I go, that's kind of interesting. And right as I'm looking, watching these dogs, this like Dalmatian, not a pure breed, mind you, this Dalmatian of sorts comes into view and up above it is this unbelievable piece of graffiti that is written, it looks like a typeface. It's written in script and it's about the war in Nepal. And I am frozen. I see the graffiti and I see the dog and I say to myself, God, that's my project right there. Because someone risk going to jail to get this message on the wall. And the reality is it doesn't matter to the dog because the dog can't read. Now that might sound ridiculous, but in my head, I said, that's my story. It's called Dogs Can't Read. And I'm gonna spend two and a half days and I'm gonna photograph street dogs and graffiti all over Palermo. Now at the time, downtown Palermo still had war, uh, bomb damage from the war, so it hadn't been revitalized and it was just this incredible historical voyage. Every time you went out into the city, Sicilians are awesome, by the way. So I work on this for two and a half days and I go back and I make a single copy of a Blurb 7.7 hardcover. I make it for myself. Dust jacket, I look at it, I go, this is kind of interesting. So I show it to a couple of people and for whatever reason, people read a political message into this book. And I'm saying, no, there is no political message. You're inventing that. It has nothing to do with me. And people would not listen. They were like, Milner, I know what you're trying to do. You're trying to downplay the political angle. And I'm like, yeah, I am because there is no political angle. People took it and ran with it. But what, to me, what it represented was an easy win as a photo project. And this is very important. The main style of work that I do is long-term projects that are always based around people. When you add people to a long-term project, your degree of difficulty goes up exponentially because you have to gain trust and you have to get permission. That can take months. It can take months and months and months of going in the field and not shooting. It is why so few people are doing this now because it takes too long to do that kind of work. The Dogs Can't Read project was an easy win. It makes me feel like, oh, I'm having success because no matter where I go, I can work on this project. So I end up going to Tijuana, Mexico, and I do a second version of the project. Then I go to New York City and I do a third version of the project. After the first three, and I make a single copy, 7-7 seven, seven hardcover from each one. Then I get a call from the founder of Blurb who says, hey, you should come to the office in San Francisco. So I fly up there and I happen to bring these three books with me. And I show them to her and she looks at them and she goes, I really like this. And I'm like, yeah, I know it's not really a serious project though. You know, this is my other stuff that's really serious where I've got to wear all black and a scarf and I've got to be moody at like cocktail parties in LA and tell people that I'm a documentary photographer. So anyway, she's like, I don't care about any of that. I love this dog thing. So she goes, what are you gonna do next? And I go, well, I'd love to go to Paris. One, because Perry Photo happens every winter. It's the biggest photo show in the world. I love going to Perry Photo, but I would also love to do a chapter of Dogs Can't Read in Paris. And she goes, great, I'm assigning you to go to Paris. So my fourth installment and the, pic the, and the, the time that I made the image I'm gonna break down, that was on assignment. Technically, I was on assignment for Blurb, although Blurb never really said, and she never said, oh, we're gonna use it for X, Y, and Z. She just said, I believe in this project, and I'm gonna assign you to go do the fourth chapter. So I end up going to Paris, my wife comes with me, it's in the middle of this freakish cold snap. It's the coldest it's been in years and I rent, through a friend, a attic apartment with no heat. My wife wanted to kill me. It was the coldest trip. It was colder than it is like right now in Santa Fe. It's blowing snow, 28. Paris was way worse. We froze almost froze to death on this story. But anyway, I do this project. I end up with four books. I have since done this project in Peru. I've done it in Panama. I've done it in uh, Nicaragua. No matter where I go, I can build this out. And again, I'm not putting this in front of you and saying, this is a great project. I'm not putting you in front of this, in front of you and saying, this is a serious project. This is just a project. It is one category of story that I can do and work on without 
breaking my neck. And then I have my other stories, which are more arduous and more complicated and more long-term. And there's huge gaps between successes and you have to be mentally prepared for that. One of the things that you can do to help yourself in doing this is to delete your Instagram account immediately. If you are using Instagram to tell you what to think and what to do, you are never going to make it in doing these projects. You have an anonymous audience who knows potentially nothing about photography that's going like this 10 million times a day. It doesn't help. And the reason I'm throwing this little Instagram jab in is because I just answered my email from over the holiday weekend. And there's one email after another from all over the world of photographers asking me how to deal with Instagram. And it's very simple. Delete it because your life is gonna be a million times better once you get past it. And two, the only way to figure out what it is you're going to photograph is to work with this and work with this. You have a conversation with yourself in the middle of a room with nothing around you. And you say, what am I interested in? What am I good at? What uh, historical things have popped out and, and made me want to investigate further? That's how you come up with story ideas. It's not a, a crowdsourced idea as to what you're gonna photograph. So let's break down this image. And remember, it's part of Dogs Can't Read Project, which is dogs and graffiti. The, the street dogs in Paris are very different than the dogs in Palermo, Tijuana, New York, uh, Nicar uh, you know, Managua. Everybody has a different flavor. This one is very Parisian to me, but I'll tell you how I did it and why I did it and how lucky I got. So let's break it down and I'll come back. Hello everyone, I am relegated to using Photoshop from what I'm about to do because there is nothing I can do to get my old system to work with my new Mac laptop. The iPad no longer records through the app that I use and one is an app on the iPad and one is a program on the laptop and they don't they don't play well together. So I've restarted everything. I've tried dongle into dongle into dongle and nothing works, so I have to cast that system away. And I'm using Photoshop and I'm telling myself everything will be okay. This is the image that a reader asked me to break out a little bit. Again, this is from Dogs Can't Read Paris. <clears throat> As a standalone image, is this good enough to make a portfolio? No. As part of a project, does it work? Absolutely. So let me break down a couple of elements here, but most importantly, why I was able to. Leica M6 or M4, 35 millimeter, T-Max 3200, black and white film. Now, the key here is the light is coming from this direction. Because of that, the light is hitting Mr. Canine here. And because the light is coming from this direction and the dog is backlit, I get this shadow right here, which is on top of the wall that the dog is jumping up. Now, that's why this portion, which is the by far the most important part of this image, it's why it works, is the shadow. Without the shadow, who cares? But I also have this nice strong diagonal here, which kind of works as a a barrier to the left of the dog. Like it just sort of is a nice line in the sand that really forces your eye to go back here to the dog. Not a whole lot happening here. And I don't really care if you're looking around back here. That's kind of an inconsequential part of this picture. Again, the shadow is the thing. Now, lighting conditions right now, not optimal. One of the ways that you can salvage pictures shot in less than optimal light is to shoot backlit. So I was very aware that the light was coming from this direction. I was not standing over here with these other people shooting this way. I was where I'm planted, shooting back into the light. That is how you salvage pictures, at least in my opinion, when you're working in bad lighting conditions. This is one of the way to make usable pictures. Learn to love the backlight. Now, most importantly, the reason I was able to make this picture, as you can see, this is a moment. This dog is in the air. He's fully stretched out. He's doing what dogs do. He's like, my life is amazing. Humans' lives suck. I have no job. All I have to do is eat and run around the park, right? It's a great life. He is in the air, caught perfectly, fully stretched out, happy dog. The reason I was able to do that is the camera is in my hand. It's not on my shoulder, it's not in my bag, and it's not in my fanny pack. Yes, of course, I wear a fanny pack. It's not in my fanny pack, it's in my hand. The exposure is set for a backlit photograph. I am exposing for this side of the dog, and I am ready for this to happen. This photograph exists in one frame. That's it. There's no other frame. Now, me personally, I think the vast majority of great reportage images over the years exist in one frame. That's it. 
they're here and then they're gone. To me, that's why I look at this picture as a personal success because I was ready to make it and I caught it. So the odds are not high, but I succeeded and it became a singular picture that became part of a larger project. All right, so that was my little Parisian adventure. And uh, I got very fortunate, like I mentioned, as to how I made this picture. Hopefully this helps a little bit. I think the best part of this film is not the breakdown of the image. I think the best part of this film is how I came to be in Paris to make this and where this project originated from. Because these projects are out there by the tens of thousands. It just takes a specific kind of eye, a specific kind of trained eye, ear, and brain to figure out what makes sense to me and what do I wanna tell you or try to explain to you. So good luck with whatever it is you're working on. I'll see you next time.